So when we're thinking of Father's Day, for those of you who are here who are guests, welcome. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Chaz, and yeah, Dad, just so you're aware, we have 26 children. Our 10th grandchild will be born this month. Three of our grandkids are here over there from five down to one. Um, I've taught pretty much all my life in church with kids and with kids making noise. I'm totally fine with it, okay? If you have other people in the back row looking at you, giving the evil eye, that's not me. <clears throat> you deal with them on your own, okay? But I'm totally cool with the kids being here. I think the church says it's family friendly and so often it's not. I don't know if you've ever been to any of those we have. It's just like, hey, welcome. You've got kids now, sorry. There's another church down the street that you can go to, but not here. So we're glad that you're all here. And today, um, we're taking a break from our study in the Gospel of John because it's Father's Day. Now, I know I didn't take a break on Mother's Day and do a biblical study on mothers, so mothers, please don't feel jilted, but there's a whole lot more that we need to understand about our Heavenly Father than our Heavenly Mother, right? Because there isn't really a Heavenly Mother, and so turn in your Bibles today to Luke chapter 15, if you would, please. Luke, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture where in your Bible it may actually have a subtitle or a heading that says the prodigal son or the lost son. That is the correct place for us to be today. Because when we look at this parable, I think we're going to understand a whole lot more about our Heavenly Father than we do about the lost son. We can all relate to the lost son, yeah? We can all understand that at some point in our life, we were wayward. We were wandering. Unless you were raised in a godly family and you actually took it and ran with it all of your life. I've met a few of you, and I'd say amen to that. And some of those people, it's funny, you talk with them, they say, oh, I don't have a testimony. I say, no, you have the testimony. You have the testimony that God desires is that you would be raised in his ways and walk in his ways all the days of your life. But for most of us, there's this little thing called rebellion that often, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I can see. Okay, most of you are rebellious, okay, I get it. And you're willing to admit it now. That's good because that's the first step of getting healed, right? As you admit the fact that, man, I want to do things my way. We're all like little Veruca from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? Daddy, I want an Impa Loompa now. And that's really kind of how we go through life, is that we want what we want, how we want it now, right? That's what humanity fallen does. But there's this desire from our Heavenly Father to have a new life, to be changed, to be radically transformed, not just informed, not to be people that could go on to jeopardy and answer every single question under Bible, Old Testament, and New Testament, he wants that information to transform our lives so that we look like lights in a dark world. And that's what God desires from us. But it all begins with a relationship. And this is the beautiful thing about God because it could just be an information. It could be just an infomercial that God writes in the sky every single morning in the clouds. It sure would make life easier as far as witnessing, wouldn't it? If we woke up every morning and there were clouds that spelt out, this is God my son is Jesus, turn or burn, right? <laughs> Just makes life a whole lot easier as far as bringing people into a right relationship with God. But is that how he's done it? No. You know what he does? He uses us as the vessels of going to talk to people about how we once were lost and now are found. How we once used to be really, really, really bad and now we're just kind of bad. And we're in the process of getting better. That's the beauty of this relationship when we're talking about a father because I don't know about you, but most people don't necessarily have the greatest memories of dad. We aren't perfect. Some of you may have great memories of dad, and so I'm not trying to discount that, but not everybody has great memories of their father. I happen to work with a guy who has horrific memories of both dad and stepdad. For those of you who know who I work with, a guy by the name of Victor Marks, and if you know his life story, dad was a pimp who denounced the fact that this was even his son, and his stepdad basically abused him in every way possible and left him for dead in a commercial cooler by the time he was five. So to talk to him about father doesn't necessarily bring up good memories in the physical realm, but he knows he's got a heavenly father who not only has eradicated and taken all those bad things that have happened and used them for good, but that heavenly father brought both of those sinful men to the foot of the cross and they both gave their lives to Christ before they died. 
And so you see the redemptive, acts, uh, the, the redemptive process that God so wants to have in our lives. It's what we call evangelism. But the fact of the matter is that evangelism all begins with a relationship as we see here. Beginning in verse 11. And then he said, this is Jesus talking, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him? He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should be merry and be glad for your brother that was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Father, we're thankful for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, that it never returns void. And as we look over and kind of inspect this passage to see just how great you are, help us this day as we leave this place to know you more clearly, to love you more dearly. And Lord, that we would be brighter shining lights for you than we ever have before in Jesus' name. Amen. Eight things I see in this passage about our Father our Heavenly Father. If you've heard this passage before, a very common passage, it's almost always we focus on the kids. Bad boy number one, bad boy number two. Even bad boy number two is bad boy because he just doesn't get it, right? But we're looking today at the Father. Very first thing that I see here, right here in verse 12, it says that he divided his livelihood. He divided unto them his livelihood. If you don't understand the basic concept of what was going on here, when this son came and said, Dad, I want you to give me what's my rightful due, his rightful due was due to him when Dad died. So basically what he's saying is, Dad, I don't want to wait till you're dead. Can you just go ahead and give it to me now? Because really, like to me right now, I'm at that stage, I'm 18, you might as well be dead anyways. I mean, this is a harsh statement of him coming to his father and asking for this. This lets us know kind of where that guy is. But what's the father's response? So he divided to them his livelihood. Beloved, our father is a giver of life. He's willing to sacrifice himself to give us life. Point number one. Look at that. In this context, how many of us as dads, maybe you've experienced this had that type of experience where your young son in his brashness and his bravado and his rebellious streak revealing comes and just kind of, you know, mom and dad, I know you guys are older, but you just don't know everything. And I do. I mean, how many of us have had that experience? Our eldest is 32. She's sitting right here. Our youngest is 17. And we've got 24 in between. Um, We've had some experiences like that. How many of us loved those experiences? Yeah, oh gosh, no. Because as a parent, you kind of sit there and you go, really? 
I raised you better than this. You're my bloodline. You should be smarter than this because you're my kid. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute. I wasn't that smart when I was your age either, right? And so there's something about life where we, many of us often have to learn the hard way. But this dad here gives him his request, knowing that in the end, this is probably what this son needs more than anything. He needs a good life lesson. He actually needs to learn the ropes of what real life is all about. And so as hard as it probably was, he divides it. But you know what? Our Father loves to give us life. It's who he is. So much so that he was willing to sacrifice his own son's life so that we could have life. Listen to what it says in John 17. Father, the hour has come. This is Jesus speaking. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Our Father is a giver of life, even to the point that he would do it at the cost of his very own son. Second point, verse 17. The son says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? So in the midst of him having squandered all of his father's wealth, his inheritance, he finds himself thinking back to his dad, and he remembers something about dad. And what does he remember about dad? He remembers that his father is what? Yes, he remembers that his father is so generous and that he's a provider for all. For all, not just for his sons. He's looking back at the fact that at our house, growing up, I remember we had servants, and even the servants had enough. Not only did they have enough, but they had extra. So he remembers that our father is a provider of all. How many of us recently have thanked God for something that he's provided for us? Oh, you didn't have to raise your hand. It was a, it's a rhetorical question. But thank you for raising your hands for those of you who are. Because the fact of the matter is, is there any good gift that comes to us that's not from God? Not according to scripture. But sometimes we see things as good gifts that weren't necessarily good gifts. They're distractions or they're things straight from the pit of hell that have been wrapped all nice to make you think they're a good gift. We must understand that good gifts do what? They draw us closer and deeper to our relationship with this heavenly father. Listen to what Jesus said concerning this about him being the provider. Do not worry. This is from Matthew chapter 6. What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Don't say these things. All these things the non-believers seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But this part, probably you have memorized, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that you need will be added unto you. Our Father is the one who will provide us with all that we need. But so frequently, we tend to get needs and wants interchanged, don't we? And so frequently, we would just like to take that passage and just make it mean to whatever, well, I really do need the new Maserati, honey. I need it. Church is up to about 50 people now. I should be driving a Maserati, okay? Doesn't that make sense, honey? I mean, that would really speak volumes to the people in Pueblo that God's doing something here if I'm driving a Maserati, right? No, no, that's not a need. That's a want. And it's really, for me, it's not even a want. It'd be a raptor. Yeah, an F-150 jumped up raptor. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, in my mind, that's what it would be. But is any of that stuff even worthy of God, I really need this. Oh, absolutely not. No. What do we really need? Boy, we need more of him. We need more of fruit, the fruit of his spirit revealed in our life, right? Especially as fathers, as dads, earthly dads. We need more love. We need more joy. We need more peace. We need more patience. We need more kindness. We need more goodness. We need more self-control. We need more faith, right? We need more of him, the things that we really need. And are we really focusing on those? And isn't it funny, too, that this loving dad doesn't just care about his children in the sense of those that have reestablished a right relationship with them? Jesus even said in Matthew 5, for he makes the sun rise on who? The evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. This is the amazing thing about our father, is that he is constantly reaching out even to those that are blaspheming and cursing him to his face. Do we understand that God has this thing called a storehouse for all the 1.21 gigawatt things we call lightning bolts, according to scripture? He's got a storehouse of lightning bolts 
that he has the ability to go to his storehouse whenever he wants and throw one somewhere. And yet, how many people do we see in the world today, regardless of what culture or nation they're coming from, that are blaspheming God to his face? And are they getting lightning bolts? That's a gracious God, isn't it? Because I know if I was God, there'd be about one person on the planet. My wife. Because what's God without a wife, right? Right. No, wh- who else would there be? Because every time somebody would do something wrong, that's worthy of a lightning bolt. That's worthy of a lightning bolt. But that isn't the way our God works. He is so merciful because he's the provider for all. Point number three, verses 18 and 19, we see him say, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What's another thing that the son remembered about his dad if he was going to actually go and do this? His dad's merciful. He's going to go and do this because he knows that his dad is going to respond, okay, I can deal with that. You're coming to me. You're coming to me in humility. Guess what? Um, I'll do that. Our father is merciful. How many of us enjoy mercy? Oh, we enjoy receiving it, don't we? How many of us love to give mercy? I'm great at receiving mercy. I love to give justice. You know, oh, no. Uh, just the other day, I was driving in the Springs, and I had a green arrow on a U-turn, so I know I'm not from Colorado yet, but I figure since I have a green arrow at a left turn, I have the ability to make a U-turn on a three-lane road that's coming the other way without slowing down, right? Am I correct? Is that the way it works here? Well, there was, I was making a U-turn, but this guy was making a right turn, which I believed was on a red light. Well, as I'm making the U-turn, he doesn't do a Colorado stop. He does a California roll through. And so I do have a police officer in the house, so maybe you can correct me on this. But as I keep going, he keeps coming too. So I stop because I just don't want to get in an accident. Well, he stops too. Well, now we're looking at each other. So then I go to move and he, as as you know, just happens to be at the same time that he goes to move. So we stop again. Well, then he guns it and peels out, and as he's peeling out, he waves at me with just one of his digits on his hand. I, being the pastor that I am, say, oh, poor man, you didn't understand, and go. No, deep down inside, I go to start to, like, chase him when I realize I've got my boss's two kids in the back seat with me, (laughs) 10-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I take my foot off the pedal, and I go, oh, I so wish they weren't in the car right now because I would catch up to that guy the next ride light and I'd pull over and I'd... And it's like, why? Why? What good was that going to do except maybe possibly get me shot? (laughs) I'd feel good in the moment of the releasing of the adrenaline and the releasing of the... hmm, I want to say righteous indignation, but that isn't true. I was just ticked off. I was just a human being who was upset and wanted to release because I felt justified. Well, guess what, beloved? Um, This father would have been totally justified when this son comes up with this idea to say, no, you made your bed, now lie in it. But that's not him. He's merciful. Do you remember back, uh, I've talked about this before, but if you've never heard this before, but there's a time when Moses in the book of Exodus is basically dealing with God and he's having a great time with God in one sense and not so great in another and he wants to see God. He's like, if I found favor in your sight, he says, God, would you now show me your glory? Well, God says, no man can see my face and live, but I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to take you and I'll put you up on a cleft of a rock. I'm going to put my hand over and I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you. And then as I pass by, I'm going to drop my hand down and you can see my backside. You can see the backside of the glory of God because that's all you can deal with. If you saw anything else, you'd basically be vaporized. And Moses is like, cool, I'll take it. It's where we get our song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Yeah, it's not left for me, it's cleft. It's a cleft of a rock that God put Moses up there and covered him up over. But when God says he's going to make all of his goodness pass before him, God proclaims with his own voice. And this is what God says about himself. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. He says, the Lord, the Lord God. And then he uses two adjectives to describe himself. Anybody remember what those are? Merciful and gracious. God, talking about himself, describing himself, and proclaiming his goodness says, merciful and gracious. That's who our Father is. We love the 
thunder type God. I, maybe that's my issue is that I've been a Minnesota Vikings fan all my life and Odin, the God of thunder, quote unquote, from the Norse mythology, you know, that's, he's all power and all strong. But our God, the true God, the one only God says of himself, he's merciful, gracious. God, in choosing the words to describe himself that would be penned and remembered for all of eternity, chose merciful and gracious. Isn't that good news for us, beloved? Because this is who God really is. We make God out to be so many different things. But when he talks about himself, and you can go and see the rest of it, because it's a lot of good things as far as we like, but then he does this. But nevertheless, I'm just, and I don't banish, and I don't uh, overlook iniquity. But he is just and righteous and punishing as well. But the first thing about him that he wants us to know about himself, he's merciful, he's gracious. And this son remembered this about his earthly dad. The fourth point, verse 20, so he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I don't know about you, but this is my favorite part of this story. And this is also the most challenging part as a dad. Because I don't think I'm really good at when the ones who are wayward, who want to come home, that I'm like waiting so that I can run and just wrap my arms around. And my wife's shaking her head and she's a pop. Yes, this is not my strong point. But beloved, I think this is the thing that we need to understand about our God. It's his strong point. For anyone that is willing to take that step back towards him, he's not like this. Like, I'll wait till they get right up behind me. No, he's looking constantly looking, and for those that'll take that step towards him, you see what he does? While they still are a great way off, it says he ran. He ran and had compassion. He didn't run to go and drop an atomic elbow on them. He wasn't getting something to to, to go and to hurt them. No, he was running to welcome them home. Our Father is swiftly compassionate. You've probably never heard those words because I put them together and I thought, well, that's weird when I was doing my study, but it's the reality of who he is. He's swiftly compassionate. And just like the eagle that we think of is so swift, especially since we see a few of them around here, it reminds us that in, according to 1 John 1, 9, what? If we confess our sins, it says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does it say that he is faithful and just to get you to write everything out and submit it, and then it goes to a committee and they'll deliberate and they'll get back to you within a month or two or at their convenience to let you know whether or not you're going to get forgiveness? Is that what it says? And sometimes we lose sight of the amazing thing that the forgiveness of God is right there, instantaneous when we will ask. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be that way. I don't think I am that way. I want them to prove that they really are truly repentant. God knows the heart. He sees and he so desires that everyone would come into this right relationship and so they'd understand that he's willing and able and desiring to hug us. When's the last time you felt you got a hug from God? You know he wants to. I don't know about you. I don't remember my dad hugging me as a child. I love my dad. I think my dad was a great dad, but there's something that maybe because I was the oops child, six and a half years after supposedly the last child, the sixth one was born, Mrs. Yandel, you're pregnant. I'm pregnant? Wow. And then things were like, wait a minute. I've been pregnant before. Yes, I am pregnant. And then they said, you know what? We were wrong. You actually aren't pregnant. We think that you have a tumor. So we want to go in and do a biopsy. True story. My mom's going, no, 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 no. I am pregnant. This is number nine. She gave birth to six, two miscarriages. I know I'm pregnant. They go, no, you have a biopsy. We want to go in and do, you have a tumor, we think, and we want to do a biopsy. So obviously, about seven months later, I'm born. The joke in the family is she took one look at me and asked the doctor, is it too late to do the biopsy? Yeah. (laughs) That's the joke in the family. My mom says, no, I didn't do that. I knew, I knew. But maybe there's something in there that when I came along that maybe my parents were kind of beyond child rearing stage. And they were more into the grandparent type stage. And so I never really remember getting a hug from my dad growing up. My dad hugs me all the time now. My dad's 90, will be 91 in August. And it's great now, but as a kid growing up, maybe I think that that kind of affected how I, even as a dad, wasn't necessarily the most huggy on my kids. 
our God so wants us to know that he loves us, how swiftly compassionate is that he'll come and fall on his, our necks and, and wrap his arms around us and kiss us to let us know that he loves us. Do we understand that? Verse uh, 22 and 24 gives us point number five. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. You see what God basically calls for when this lost one comes home? What's he say? It's party time. And this is something about our God that we need to understand. He's rejoicingly jubilant. Here's another good combo for you that you probably never heard. He's rejoicingly jubilant. He's rejoicing over the fact that the lost ones come home. And this is what he does. When we look and we see in the Old Testament, even when the setup with Leviticus 23 for the seven feasts that the Lord calls, six of the seven feasts are all parties. There are times of rejoicing and feasting. There's only one time of the year that he wanted us, the children of Israel at least, to be somber and to consider things kind of in a somber way, and that was on the Day of Atonement, pointing forward towards what it would cost him to pay for the price of sin to be taken care of. But all the other feasts are feasts of feasting. And so it's a good thing when the church is festive. It's a good thing when the church wants to rejoice and to have great parties. There's nothing wrong with that because it's God's it's what he does. He's rejoicingly jubilant. Listen, back in Zephaniah 3.17, it says this, The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. How many of us have ever thought about the fact that God would sing over us? Our five-year-old granddaughter rode up with me last night to take her daddy to the airport because he had to get back to San Diego for work. So on the way up, she went, Daddy, Daddy, can you play such and such so that I can sing? And it's like, oh, I don't have it on my phone. That's on Mommy's phone. He's telling her, well, well, can you get it on your phone so I can sing? And I was like, honey, you don't need it. Just sing. No, I need it to sing. And then he was trying to find it, and he couldn't find it. And so finally, Dad thought of, hey, what about the song that you sang at the end of the school year just last? And she goes, oh, I know that one. And she broke right into Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World and sang the whole thing. I'm trying to, you know, drive while I'm crying, listening to my five-year-old. She's back there going, I see trees of green. <laughs> yeah. No, she wasn't doing that, but I thought to myself, what did they have them listen to? It'd be so great to see a whole group of five-year-olds up there. I see, you know, just with a raspy voice. <laughs> but the fact that she was singing this over there, and I was thinking about my message as I'm driving. I'm going, oh my gosh. Lord, you sing over us. You rejoice over us. You rejoice over us even in the state that we are now. Do we get that? That God's so stoked about us right where we are now? Granted, we may not be so happy with where we are right now, but he is because you know what? He knows where we're going. And he's around his potter's wheel and he's allowing and causing all these circumstances to form us into who he wants us to be. This is the God whom we serve. This is our Father. That just blows me away. Listen to this also. Luke 15, 7, Jesus said, I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. When that person takes that step of faith back to the Lord or come to the first time, to come to God, you know what happens in heaven? Celebrate good time. I mean, you know, it's a holy song. Sorry for those of you who didn't want to hear that. But there's a celebration over the fact that a lost one's coming home. That's our Father, rejoicingly jubilant. Sixth point. Oh, here fun now. Verse 28. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Older son's not happy about what's going on. But what does dad do when he finds out about what's going on? Father goes. Have you ever heard this term before that our God is a missionary God? He didn't set up some sign in the sky and said, climb the highest mountain, go up to Pike's Peak, and then try to jump to get to where I'm at. No, he came. He sent his representative. He sent his one and only son for the sake of the fact that he's a pursuing pleader. He goes after the lost. You know, I can't remember who the guy that wrote it, John, you probably can tell me, um, referred to him as the hound of heaven. 
the hound of heaven. It's that God himself goes after the lost. And he goes in a way that he says, look at this, um, Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God goes after people and says, here's the deal. You've got sin, and that sin needs to be taken care of. And it can be, because I love you so much that I sent my son to pay for it. And this, beloved, is the greatest deal on planet Earth that you will ever find, ever and ever and ever, is the fact that God offers salvation for free. He offers salvation without any provisos except believe. Believe that this deal that's so beyond belief is true, and guess what? It can be yours today. Not for three small payments of 1995, and with a free set of Ginsu knives for the first caller, hundreds of people that call in. The fact of the matter is that all who would come, any who would come, he will in no means cast you out. It's the greatest deal on planet Earth, and for many people, it's just too good to be true. It can't be. Why would he do it that way? Guess what, beloved? We don't know why, but just be thankful that this is the way it is, because if you will look at everything that's out there on the planet concerning any type of religion that is offering you some type of way of coming back into a right relationship with God, and you see everything that's out there, this is the only one that really actually makes sense but then it even doesn't make sense because it's too good to be true. But it is what it is. He loves us and he pleads with us. Come, let us reason. I'll talk with you. God will talk with us. And you don't have to go to the place and have your wear a jacket like this because you're talking with God. God desires for us to understand that he will come and meet us where we're at and plead and explain to us why it is that we should come to him. Seventh point. The father says to him in verse 31, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. This should be great comfort to us, beloved. Our father's always with us. Always with us. Remember, we see, uh, what is it, in Isaiah chapter 7. A child shall be born, concerned to be born to a virgin, and the list of the names he shall be called, one of them is what? He shall be called Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. God so wanted us to understand that he would always be with us that he sent his only begotten son so that we would understand, I really always will be with you. Because all that's recorded of him, all you have to do is think about the things that have been recorded about Jesus and guess what? I'm with you. And guess what? Jesus loved us so much that he said, I'll send my spirit so that he'll always be with you. From the beginning of creation, we see the desire of God is for us as his children to understand that he'll always be with us. And that, beloved, is great news. Spurgeon talked about John Wesley because John Wesley died with this saying on his lips, the greatest thing of all, God with us. Spurgeon said, Wesley died with that on his lips. May we live with that on our hearts. That we'd actually understand that wherever it is that we go, God is with us. Thankful for everybody who serves in the U.S. military. Thankful that people are willing to go and to lay their lives down, if need be, so that others can have their freedom. Bob, remember, don't you ever, ever, ever forget, wherever it is that you have to go, and if it's into harm's way, God's with you. Always. It's his promise. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And guess what? For some of us who don't think that we're going into harm's way, um, for those of us who work in the springs, that's that's harm's way, isn't it? What is it about the springs and people wanting to kill people? It doesn't matter where we are because we are followers. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, guess what? We've got a bullseye in the spiritual realm on us. It's called the seal of the Holy Spirit, which means that you are no longer part of the kingdom of darkness. You're part of the kingdom of light. And you know what that bullseye does? It says, guess what? Um, You're an enemy. And when we don't realize that we are in a constant spiritual battle in this life, we are very easily duped into the schemes of the enemy. We must remember there's a spiritual battle going on, and this spiritual battle isn't just about us. It's about everybody around us that we can affect. As a dad, as a husband, as a, uh, as a wife, as a child, as a student, as a, a teacher, as a leader, as a business owner, whatever it is that we do, there are people around us that if we do not follow the way of the Lord closely, others can be negatively affected. 
And that's what the enemy's trying to do. And this is where we close today with the 8 1 verse 32. It was right, this is the Father speaking again, that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Our Father brings the lost home. This past week in my reading, I was reading in 2 Samuel and I came across this passage, I don't know if you remember, when Absalom basically had been separated from David and separated for a while that Joab, the general of the army, basically got this woman from Tekoa to go and to speak to David, but to speak almost like hypothetically about something that she was going through, about the fact that one of her sons had killed the other son. She only had two, and the fact of the matter was that the rest of the community and the family was calling for that son who lived, who killed the other, to be brought to justice so that he would be killed as well. She explained this to David, and as she explained it to David, David said, no, there's no reason for him, for you to have this pain and this sorrow in your life to lose both of your sons. Yes, what he did was wrong, but for you to lose that other, your living son would be even worse. Well, that was basically what David was doing with Absalom. But there's a statement that she makes in there, and I don't know if you've ever seen this verse before, but you can find it and underline it for you. But in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14, In the explanation, she says, Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. He devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. You know, all throughout Scripture, we see that the God of the universe does not delight in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33. But the will of God is that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Second Peter, this is our Father. This is what he's all about. And beloved, if we're going to be followers of our Father, then we need to understand that this is what basically our life in Christ needs to be about. We need to be that same type of people that are concerned with the banished ones, concerned with the ones that the world calls outcasts, the, world, the ones that the world thinks that are so far beyond redemption. But how do we ever get to that point if we read our scriptures remember from the New Testament there was this guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus. We call him Paul now, but do we remember that Saul of Tarsus was the scourge of the church? That he took delight in bringing Christians to be killed? That he was engaged and involved, his whole life was about glorifying God supposedly by bringing Christians to be killed. And he took great delight in it. But one day he got knocked off his high horse and he found out that those people that he was killing, Jesus saw them as part of himself. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Beloved, do we understand that there's people out there in the world that maybe we're not very fond of? Especially currently. Not popular to say, but as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be praying for the salvation of the people who align themselves with ISIS. We must be praying for their salvation. I think that's the heart of God, is that those people would come to see the evil that they've fallen into and now come to, out of the darkness into the light. Granted, in the spot where the military needs to take them out physically, as in take them out of this world and give them the good news, as some of my friends say, that has to happen as well. But we as the church who aren't involved in that, guess what? Our responsibility? Be crying out to God for mercy on those people's souls. Because if we don't do that, you know what we've lost sight of, beloved? We've lost sight of the heart of the Father. But how many of us don't really deal with that in our daily realm? How about the people that were just simply passing by in the Walmart or passing by on the street or passing by wherever it is that just from their external smell, look, choice of hairstyle, choice of piercings, choice of whatevers, do we think that they're beyond the love of God? God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the heart. And are we following the heart of our Father? Because He brings the lost home. And that's what He wants us to be involved with. We don't force them to come home. But has anybody come across lately somebody that they simply wanted to tell 
about the good news. We were in uh, Colorado Springs earlier this week, and I'm sorry if I gave you the call to come up early and you thought so, but, but you look good back there too. But we were going through the park, and there was uh, three young people, and they had a slack line set up. Anybody know what a slack line is? Yeah, a slack line is basically this really cool tightrope that's portable, but it's about that wide, about two inches. It's basically a glorified strap uh, like from the, that you have in the back of your car and your truck to, to, to hold things down. But you set it up between two trees, and then you basically tightrope walk on it. But, I mean, it, it, they have it kind of low. But we were going through the park, and there were these three young people doing this. And if you've ever seen anybody do it, it's really fun to just, you just sit there and watch. Go, That's amazing, because if you've ever tried one, and I have, it's hard. It, it's hard to stay on the thing. It's easy to get on and fall down and hurt yourself and make yourself look silly. But if you can actually see somebody on it who's actually walking and doing things, and they actually had one of the guys there was really good. He was actually like doing stuff to where he could sit on it and stand up from it, where he could actually jump from one place on it to another and land and not fall off. And so we were just tripping out. And then our five-year-old daughter or granddaughter came over, uh, caught up with us where we were, and they just reached out to her, hey, would you like to try, honey? And she was like all on it. And they were the sweetest, nicest people that were doing it. And after, we just talked with them a little bit afterwards. And then we went to get ice cream. And as I went, I'm going, man, I should have invited them to come get ice cream. So I said, no, you know what? I'll just get a gift certificate and go back. So I got the gift certificate and went back and started talking to them. And I explained to them, I, said, I just wanted to tell you guys, there's something about you, your love that's oozing, how you dealt with her and how you just let us watch without saying anything or whatever. And I said, I just see something. And well, it turns out, that she was baptized in the Calvary Chapel when she was young, wayward from the Lord now, and he had never had anything to do with the church before, but I got to sit there and talk to them and talk to them about Jesus and just exchange phone numbers and pictures. Beloved, there's all these people out there. They don't have to. It's not like, okay, today I'm going to go find somebody and cram the gospel down their throat. But as you're going through life, you're going to come across people that you're going to feel the Lord nudging you just to say something, just to begin a conversation, to see something about them. And guess what, beloved? If we will listen to the small soul voice of the Lord as it leads us to do that, we will be involved with him bringing his banished ones home. We can't force anybody to come home, but boy, we sure can help them know that there's a God out there that loves them, that still loves them right where they're at, and he's willing to take them in right now. Because guess what? Once you're inside, that's when he works on us. That's when he takes us and, reform, and reforms us and changes us. So you know how long that takes to have us reformed? Until we die. It's a lifelong process. And along the way, guess what? There's some ups, there's some downs, there's some challenges, there's some victories. But it's the beautiful process that the Bible calls sanctification. And it's all about a relationship with our Father being reestablished or established for the first time by faith in Jesus, because that's the only way that it works. And so, Father, we're thankful for this day, this day that we get to celebrate our Heavenly Father's Day. Lord, we just want to tell you that we love you. We want to thank you for all that you've done in our lives and all that you're doing. And, Lord, maybe there's somebody here today that just wants to begin that walk with you. Lord, there's no magic words. There's no formulaic statement that they need to make. They simply need to, in their heart, come to you and let them know that they want to start. And they thank you for this opportunity because of what you've done in Jesus. And as we continue to worship you today, would you be glorified, God, in our midst? Would you take these songs that we sing and as the children are next door learning about you as well, would all of this bring honor and glory to your name? Our desire is that you would be glorified. We want to see you high and lifted up because we know what happens through that is that people come into a right relationship with you through Jesus and that lives are radically transformed. Sin is stopped. Bondages are broken. So much in the positive happens when we will simply come to you, our Heavenly Father, and begin this right walk with you. So continue to have your way with us this day. For your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name.